Hello, I'm Jo Grace. I run the Sensory Projects and I'm the organiser of today. So you will be seeing a much more raggedy looking me, I think, doing the live links throughout the day. You will have noticed that in setting up this event, I was playing around with the letters P, M, L, D, O. Oh, you can see my little light in there. There you go. P, M, L, D. I think I had um, profound and multiple learning developments because there's so many interesting speakers today who knows what we will learn or people meeting and learning differently because we have to there's been a global pandemic we've all got used to this online world um, some of you may have read my book product placement I have to my publishers have challenged me to wave my books in front of you more, so I'm going to try and wave as many books at you as possible as I can in this slot. Some of you may have read this book, Sensory Being for Sensory Beings, and in it I introduce the term sensory beings, which I know a lot of people use now as a definition in the positive for people with PMLD, because I was uncomfortable with deficit-based narratives, because you're pointing out, you know, that this is somebody who, who hasn't got cognitive capacity, who hasn't got physical ability, it's it's a definition by deficit and that doesn't sit easily with me. Um, sensory beings was just a term that was useful to me, I wasn't pitching it as a, as a useful alternative, it was for my use, but it's nice that people have taken it up. Um, but this presentation is not about um, that move away from defining by deficit, it is an exploration of the use and the meaning of the term PMLD and the risks within our understanding of that term. So for starters, PMLD is an umbrella term. <laughs> it's a catch-all term. It's not a diagnosis. It's not um, informative in the way that a diagnosis would be about a person. It's an umbrella term, it scoops up a lot of different people, all sheltered under the one umbrella, and the idea is that it has a use, you know, and the use of this umbrella term is in its collective power, in that underneath this umbrella you have lots of very different people who have needs in common. So for example, we might all need um, accessible toilets, you know, changing places toilets, or we might all need hoists providing and if we were to campaign for those things or if services were to be provided according to the little groups that fall underneath that umbrella then you would have sort of 10 people with one rare condition saying oh we need this and five people over here with another rare condition saying oh we need this and when we all gather together as one big group then it's got a lot more weight behind it and we can petition for the services and provision that that is needed. There is also a risk to that umbrella term and the risk is in people feeling that it is informative in the way that a diagnosis is informative. It is a collectal term, it's not a diagnosis. If you want a definition of the term, this is the core and essential service standards for supporting people with profound and multiple learning disabilities. It's free to download from my website and it's free to download from PMLD Link's website. And in here you will find the most recent attempt, possibly the most recent attempt, at a definition of what PMLD means. And it's interesting in that in this document it's not described as a definition, it's titled towards a definition because because it's not a diagnosis it's not a definitive thing in the way that a diagnosis is but the start point to the definition is that somebody who has PMLD will have a profound intellectual disability and you might come across if you read research or if you read around um, this topic you might come across the term P-I-M-D, which is often used in different countries, and that means profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. And the P of the profound in both versions 
is in relation to a person's cognitive capacity. There are these levels, profound intellectual disabilities, severe intellectual disabilities, moderate intellectual disabilities, and these are all associated with IQ, is a bit of a debatable term, but these are associated with levels of cognitive ability. And so when I say something like somebody with PMLD cannot learn to read, I'm not having low aspirations, I'm just stating a truth. If you have a profound intellectual disability, by definition, you can't learn to read. If you are somebody who can learn to read, then you don't have a profound intellectual disability. You have a severe intellectual disability or moderate or, or no intellectual disability at all. And so you can see where the risk is beginning to come because understanding it as being as informative as an individual diagnosis isn't helpful. What would be really helpful is that if we could have, you know, an understanding of each person's particular diagnoses and their particular sets of needs. But actually, with many of the rare conditions, knowing that, you know, it's a deletion of gene 132 on the left hand side doesn't really tell us much about the individual because we don't know much about that rare condition. Hopefully in time we will know more and then exploring the individual diagnoses would be useful. But whilst we're dealing with a, an unknown, I think it is valuable to introduce a second umbrella. <laughs> Underneath that original umbrella term, we have two distinct groups. We have people who have profound and multiple learning disabilities, and we have people who have profound and multiple barriers to learning. So if I get my little... So we go from profound and multiple learning disabilities to profound and multiple barriers for learning. And being aware that those two groups exist, that both groups exist. Not that people with PMLD are automatically people with PMBL, which is an assumption that gets made a lot, but that both groups exist can be protective of both groups. If you find that you're taking part in narratives that just say one group exists, then that's good for that group, but it's not so good for the other group. Um, I think if you, if you want an example of um, what PMBL looks like, look up the campaigner Jonathan Bryan, who um, is active online as Teach Us Too. He's a young man who looks like he has profound and multiple learning disabilities. You know, he's in a funky wheelchair, he has multiple healthcare needs, but he's intellectually very capable. And his um, account of what school was like for him is very compelling. He says, you know, when I started school, the, my teachers were really nice, the teaching assistants were really nice, and we did some really interesting sort of fun sensory play, and I really enjoyed it. And then the next year I was at school, you know, the teachers were really nice, the teaching assistants were really nice, and we carried on doing the sensory play. And, and then, you know, and then the next year, you know, after a while it just gets boring. You know, you want to learn more. There is a risk to somebody who has profound and multiple barriers to learning, that is somebody who looks as if they have PMLD but is actually cognitively able, of us assuming that they have PMLD. But there is also a risk in the other direction too. So being aware of both groups is protective. And to give you an example of the risk in the other direction, um, there was a setting I met where the, um, the narrative was that the students with PMLD would all be able to learn to read. And the way that they were going to learn to read was by becoming symbolic communicators. So the first step was going to be understanding and recognising symbols and using them to communicate choices, which is a brilliant thing to do. If you are capable of doing it, it's a great thing to do. Um, and so because the setting had high aspirations, they believed that everybody was going to be everybody was going to be able to do this. Just, you know, red flag those words. Um, everybody was going to be able to do it. And so what they had been doing was hand over hand symbol matching for 16 years. 
So some of these young people had spent 16 years being presented with two symbols and then a third symbol that matched one of the first two and somebody would pick up their hand and match the symbol. And it's so reminiscent of what Penny Lacey saw in the early 80s, post the 1982 Warnock Report, when people with profound and multiple learning disabilities were first entitled to an education. Penny Lacey, who used to lead, prior to her death, the Masters in Profound and Multiple Learning Disabilities at Birmingham University, wanted to know how this new um, right to an education was being met. And she went into classrooms and she found teachers um, with like a circle of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities and the teacher would be sat in front and reading them a story. And the argument was, well, we believe that they are intellectually capable. So we have high aspirations for them. We think that um, they can understand. They, they can't show us that they can understand, but we believe in them. And what you witnessed in those times was a room full of passive people who looked very disabled, disconnected, blank. And then along comes the likes of Flo Longhorn and Les Staves and Richard Hurstwood, and you get the dawning of the sensory curriculum, I'm waving other people's books now. <laughs> um, and the response to this is, is a revolution. You go into those classrooms, you, you can read it in Penny's work, you go into those classrooms and you see the people who were once passive in their chairs, active and engaged. You know, the accounts of those things are there in, those, in the testimonies of people who first worked in sensory rooms, who first worked with sensory resources and the sensory curriculum. They report the, you know, these previously passive, seemingly very disabled people becoming animate, becoming engaged, moving, vocalising. So there's a huge, huge value to the sensory curriculum for people who have profound and multiple learning disabilities. And there is a huge value to a curriculum that recognises that you can have cognitive capacity whilst having physical learning disabilities for people who have profound and multiple barriers to learning. But there is a risk of both curriculums to the other group. We have to remember, practically, when we're working, that there should be two umbrellas, not just one. If you're just choosing one, whichever one you choose, there is a risk of using that brolly for, for the other group. Um, that setting, by the way, the one where they'd been doing 16 years of hand over hand symbol matching, began sharing sensory stories. And actually, sensory stories are a good sort of halfway point, because if you have a sensory story that has good intellectual content and rich sensory content, then you're, you're a sort of halfway point, aren't you? You're, you're not doing too badly by either group. You would be telling that story and looking and observing and reflecting and working out, are you in this group, are you in this group, so that your next thing is more tailored towards that person. But that setting started sharing sensory stories and they got the most amazing piece of feedback. The lady, the teacher in the room who had made the move she had dropped, you know, as far as the rest of the school was concerned, she had low aspirations because she had thrown out the symbol matching. She'd given up on this narrative of eventually you will be able to do it. We believe in you. We're just going to keep going, keep going. And the parents of these children who had been told, you know, one of them for the last 16 years, that don't worry, we, we will do it. Your son will be able to do this. Your son will be able to do this. She was really worried when it got to the first parents evening because she was thinking, these parents might be cross with me. And one family, the family of this boy who'd been doing it for 16 years came in and the parents said, what have you been doing with our son? And she said, oh, I've been doing sensory stories, you know, why? And they said, well, he's been so different at home. He's begun looking at us. He used to sit in the corner of the room, you know, head down, disengaged. But now he looks at us and he follows us as we go around the room and he seems more interested in life. 
and that parallels with the impact of the sensory curriculum when it was first introduced and we don't want an awareness that people can have cognitive capacity hidden behind physical disability to flip us back to the 1980s. We need to make progress and so the way that we make that progress is in recognising the risk. The risk, the red flag, is when people say all or everybody. All of these people have PMLD. All of these people have PMBL. This approach will work for everyone. Be especially concerned when it's people selling you an approach. You know, there are some amazing reading strategies out there that are very heavily promoted. If you ask somebody whose job it is to sell you that strategy, is this strategy suitable for my students? They will say yes, because their job is to sell you that strategy. You have to be reflective yourself and think, how will I know if this is effective? Because that boy had 16 years of his life wasted. You know, and we mustn't be wasting people's time. It's very precious time. Yes, we must fulfill our duties as, you know, whatever type of professional we are. Parents, you're free, you don't have to do this. You're, you have totally free reign. But as a professional, you may have to be ticking a certain box. But these are lives, not jobs. You know, and they are incredibly precious lives. If what we do wastes their time, you know, if you waste an hour of my time, you've probably wasted quite a small percentage of my life. If you waste an hour of somebody's time who is going to live a foreshortened life, you've wasted a much bigger percentage of their life. Their time is precious. Precious in a way, you know, everybody's time is precious, but their time is more precious because they have less of it. So we mustn't be wasting it. I, I realise I've said, you know, 16 years was wasted. I don't want to be saying that, you know, after a year you should stop because progress can be small and can be over a huge period of time. Look at the work that they do at the Chaley Heritage Foundation where they will work for years and years and years on developing a skill with an individual and they have very high aspirations for all their children in their care. The difference is there is no one-size-fits-all approach. There is no all will do this or everybody or this is suitable for everybody because those ones are a red flag. Those ones are not respecting difference. They're denying it. They're, they're denying the existence of a very vulnerable group when you say that type of everybody. At Chaley, they have high aspirations and those high aspirations relate to each person. So it's really important that we recognise these groups and that we do not deny the existence of one group with narratives of high aspiration. I, I should show you, um, it's got to be personal, that, that was the point. And so I was thinking, okay, I should share something personal because that underlines that it's got to be personal. So I should show you a photo of me um, heartbroken as a 23 year old. If I can find it, I will, pop it, screenshot it in here. If I can't find it, it's because I, I dug around in the roof and <laughs> couldn't find it. But it is a picture of me at 23, um, slumped on the floor um, in, the, in my sister and brother-in-law's apartment and I'm heartbroken. Um, the boy, the beautiful boy dumped me um, and if you've read, <laughs> look, more book waving, if you've read The Subtle Spectrum, you'll know that it's at that point in my life that I stopped listening to music um, because it was really, you know, he did a good job of breaking my heart. And my brother-in-law and my sister were very worried about me. And my brother-in-law said, you know, Joe, we just want you to be happy. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to be happy. I just want him back. <laughs> And although, you know, the wanting him back part is maybe not the best idea, the truth of it is that in my life, I don't aspire to be happy. I am often happy, but it's not something I aim for. I, I want to be useful. I want to be kind. I'd love it if one day I was wise. These are the things I aspire to. I don't aspire 
to happiness. If, you know, I, I don't object to it, but those are my measures. And you think we each lead our own lives and we each have our own measures. And it's when that narrative of high aspiration is applied in a blanket format that it's for everybody and that the aspiration is always towards the same goal. That's not aspirational. It's ableist. It's prejudice. When we're setting a scale that says the high aspiration, the top is intellectual capacity and the bottom is cognitive disability, we're saying that in order to be better, you have to make a small cognitive step of progress. You know, I, I, I'm not measuring my life by how much cleverer I'm getting day by day. I don't expect it to be on my headstone or read at my eulogy, but we're setting a scale that says top is cognitive capacity and bottom is cognitive incapacity. And when we say that all people with PMLD are capable of, for example, something like learning to read, everybody can do it, everybody, what we're doing is denying that that group exists. And people do exist who have profound intellectual disability. People do exist who have a level of intellectual disability that means that they will never be able to learn to read, just like you will never be able to learn to fly. You know, I might be able to put wings on your back and give you a flying-like experience. You might be able to make movements that sort of indicate that you would be willing to fly, but you will never be able to fly. And I'm not having low aspirations when I say that, I'm just stating a truth. And we must be so careful not to deny the existence of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities because they are such a vulnerable population already and their access to the sensory curriculum and to those beginning parts of our understanding for them was so hard won to get rid of it dressed up as aspiration is really unfortunate it has become taboo in some settings to acknowledge intellectual um, disability. You know, we, we can't, you know, allow ourselves to say that somebody is not capable in that way. But it's because we are frightened of having low aspirations. And I'm not in any way saying have low aspirations for people with profound and multiple learning disability. I'm saying respect the difference. You know, if we value lives as they are, and if we value them as belonging to the person who lives them. My brother-in-law might want for me to be happy, but I want, you know, to be useful. It's a different thing and it's my life and I should get to decide. You know, if we value that life as belonging to that person and not measured or justified by their ability to inch their way up a cognitive scale and again I'm not saying that inching your way up a cognitive scale is bad there is value in learning for learning's sake it's something that I you know sing about in the sensory stories course and in the sensory stories book there is absolutely value for somebody learning even if their learning is only going to be small I'm just saying that's not the measure to hold people to that is not the measure of high aspirations what we are looking for is to understand that person you know what I would want is for us to recognize that people with what have I got P M L D are living many profoundly different lives so when we see that umbrella we might think of two umbrellas we might look under that umbrella see that person and think what is a high aspiration for you not what is the high aspiration that is set by the policy in my institution not what is the high aspiration that you know is set by whatever other outside force but what is my high aspiration for you what measure am i going to use and i would want for those people to be known and valued for who they are as they are right now and high aspirations could be connection they could be for that person to have an impact to have an effect that could be aspirations for joy for happiness it could be for belonging and if you do this if you look to measure your high aspirations from that start point 
of knowing the individual and making a connection, then when you do that, you make a profound and meaningful, lifelong, life-changing difference. I said that their time is precious, that the percentage that an hour represents of their life is likely to be much bigger than it is of ours. And in my work as a sensory engagement specialist, one of the awful privileges that I have is attending the funerals of people that I have worked with. And at one funeral of an 18 year, year old young man, his father gave the eulogy and described him as a provoker and provider of love. And I can't think of any aspiration higher than that. That's what I would wish for.